White Sox and the Yankees game one 59 degrees in the Bronx really a pleasant night. Wind at this moment doesn't appear to be too much of a factor and Mike Messina able to blow into that pitching hand and here is the lineup he will take on a very good dangerous and well balanced Boston lineup Damon Bellhorn Ramirez Ortiz the DH his big swipe and extra innings. In game four did it for the Boston Red Sox actually game three over Anaheim then Millar Nixon Veritek Orlando Cabrera and Billy Miller is batting ninth. He's the third baseman Johnny Damon ready to go and so are these fans. Johnny Damon just as important to the Boston offense as Derek Jeter is to the Yankees. And he has had a terrific postseason to this point, seven out of 15. The 01. Only two. Damon, Bellhorn, and Ramirez for Terry Francona. One out as Messina makes another game one start for the Yankees. Two fastballs and then the knuckle curve. The Yankees did not have a 15 game winner and won 101 ball games. First team to ever do that. Mike Messina, as much as any pitcher on either side, smart and resourceful. With one out, nobody on. Mark Bellhorn is at the plate. Bellhorn only one for eleven in the division series. Checks his swing. One ball, one strike. Just able to lay off on that pitch down and in. One and one with one out, nobody on. On the line in the center, Bernie Williams has it two out. Knuckle curb and Williams with his speed and his glove and his reach. Second out. And with two out, nobody on. Manny Ramirez walks in. Baseball fans grab a cold, fresh Budweiser. It's game time. Here is Manny Ramirez. And you wonder, Al, how Mike Messina will try and go after Manny Ramirez. Well, his batting average is low, but he's got him for seven home runs. That's including regular season, career, and postseason. So Ramirez has been able to hit the long ball off Messina, and he was up there ready to rip. Combination of Ramirez and Ortiz in the divisional series, good for a 458 average, two homers, 11 RBIs. That 3 4 combination, a big reason why the Red Sox are here, and the 1 2 combination of Jeter and A Rod, a big reason why the Yankees are in the ALCS. I know you can't do it, but if you combine those four players, that'd be a pretty Pretty good first four hitters in the lineup. Two out, nobody on, one ball, one strike. Pretty close, two to one. These two just hit, 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 hit during the regular season, and it carried over. They did in the Anaheim Angels. And it was Ortiz who won it with that off Washburn to dunk Anaheim at Fenway. The 2 1. That is a nasty splat slider off the plate away. And down. 
The Cena so far does not have to be smart and resourceful. Excellent stuff in the early going. Schilling, a big game guy. He has certainly earned his shillings. High fastballs and low splitters. As a hitter, you feel like a bobblehead doll with the head going up and down and up and down. Jeter first up. Then A Rod in Sheffield. <laughs> Strike one. Jeter during the regular season really came on and ended up hitting 292 during the division series, six out of 19. With a home run and four RBIs. Strike two. Jeter, one guy who has not handled Kurt Schilling well, only three for 21 in his career. An outstanding two strike hitter. Have to go to right field with two strikes on him. Now will Schilling try and get him with an 0-2 count? Reaching for it into right center field. Nixon, Damon, Nixon, one out. Take a look at the rest of the Yankee lineup. Nice running grab by Trot Nixon to start the night defensively. Cheater. Now it's A-Rod. Sheffield, Matsui, Bernie Williams. Jorge Posada, John Olroot, Miguel Cairo. It's Kenny Loft in the DH tonight, replacing Ruben Sierra. See the numbers for Alex Rodriguez, who digs his way in here. He really stepped up, and Joe Torre saw a different look in his eye in the division series after coming on late in the regular season. Got off to a slow start with the Yankees and takes ball one. Stepped up and stepped over to steal a third base and then scoring on the wild pitch to give the Yankees the division series against the Twins. That's hard hit but foul. One ball one strike. You're watching Fox Sports broadcasting in the world's finest high definition standard. While this is a rematch of a year ago, there's so much more anticipation. There are so many new faces from the ALCS from 2003. And with the way last year's ended on the Aaron Boone home run, with the addition of Schiller and A-Rod for the Yankees, Folk, Flash Gordon, Sheffield, right on down the line. This matchup seemed predetermined, and here we are, inning one of game one, Wondering what's about to unfold over the next week. Rodriguez, then Sheffield. Just missed. Two and two. Where? That was the first quizzical look you've given me in our broadcast time together, Al Leiter. Well, it's the pitcher in it. You yeah. liked the pitch. Schilling liked it, but Randy Marsh didn't. He's the home plate umpire. Okay. It's pitches like that. Certainly Schilling is a guy who's very established and a veteran player who can deal with it. But when you're facing such a great hitter such as A-Rod, you make your pitch, pitches that you work on weekly, daily, yearly, forever, and you... You make it and they miss it. It's uh, it's frustrating. Sometimes it can carry on to the next pitch or two. Yeah, it's often said about teams four outs in an inning. You don't want to give a hitter like A Rod four strikes in an at bat. It's a full count. Fastball away. Here hit it and A Rod does. This one easier for Nixon. Two out. Well, you know Nixon's in right. Take a look at how Boston covers the field. What a different team, especially defensively, this Red Sox ball club became when they picked up Orlando Cabrera, trading deadline day, and in essence,
switched Cabrera for Nomar Garciaparra. The two out, nobody on his Sheffield right on top of the plate takes a strike. That's Cabrera who has been the adhesive of this defense. Is there any more intimidating presence on top of the plate anymore than Gary Sheffield? Well, for me, not, not present day players. He's right on top of the plate, and every time it seems as though you pitch a ball outside, it looks like he's just going to come right back at you. You have to pound him in on the hands. He likes ex to extend his arms like most home run hitters. Two balls and a strike. That's why Mark Bellhorn is, is almost on the left side of the infield. Gary Sheffield will ground the ball through the right side. But this is a, a quasi shift that the Red Sox have on Sheffield. All that wiggling will make a guy tired if somebody doesn't want to pitch it. So Sheffield steps out. He does that as a timing device to stay back on breaking balls. He's up on the count three and one. Sheffield getting his first taste of this rivalry in the postseason. Looking forward to these games with the rest of us. 3-1 pitch. Fair into the corner. Sheffield will start this ALCS with a double. Two out. First inning double. Not a bad start. Sheffield. He said because of the waggle, he stays back on breaking balls. This is a hanging slider and a tracer down the left field line. You can see that slider spin. Not a good pitch from Schilling, but a slider and a fastball count. That's right, which 3-1 count for Schilling, very well aware of Sheffield's capability with off-speed up out over the plate, but with a 3-1 count in most instances early in the game, He's thinking Sheffield's looking fastball. He's got a free strike to get to 3-2. He didn't get it. Now it's Matt Sewing. Runner at second, two out. The Yankees could take the lead with a hit. Huge ball for a strike. Hideki Matsui has slipped right into the cleanup role for Joe Torre, and he often gets overlooked. Look at the numbers he put up this season against the Red Sox. 361 average, the 18 RBIs, 18 of his 108. Outside corner, now the inside. It's 0 2. Schilling is retying the shoelace on that right shoe. A heavily taped right ankle. They've been toying with putting a metal rod in there for extra stability. He has that short acting anesthetic marking shot into that. Ankle. You try to melt the pain, really, and that's that's really what it is. It's not a cortisone shot, but it's something that should wear off by the end of the night. Here's how he aggravated it late in the division series, game one out in Anaheim. Runner at second, Sheffield two out, an 0-2 count. Matsui has stepped out. I would imagine the push off foot, it would be worse to have that ankle bothering you than the one on which you land. No question about it, especially for a power pitcher like Shilly, who relies on a lot of force, backside, his legs, and everything else. He has to feel the force to push. And what will happen if he is feeling sore in the foot? To get underneath some pitches and probably be elevated in on all of his pitches. Like that 3 1 slider to Sheffield. Matsui sticks the back out in the left. Base hit. The Yankees strike first. What a beautiful piece of hitting by Matsui. One to nothing, New York. Anytime you have an injury, such as maybe as uh, minute as an ankle, you want to make sure that you still have the same delivery. I'm not quite sure how, how much Kurt pushes off, but here's a good split, a great split, down and away, in the dirt, clearly a ball, and Matsui, great hitting. Hit that ball with one hand to give the Yankees the lead. 
Matsui continues to kill the Red Sox. A little floater to drop in. It goes as an RBI double. And now Bernie Williams grounds it through the right side. Matsui coming home. 2 0 New York. Killing, retiring Jeter and Rodriguez, and three two out hits. A double by Sheffield, a double by Matsui, and an RBI single by Bernie Williams. Bam, bam, bam. Two nothing Yankees. The Yankees, the best in the American League this season, and they score first. They're up 2 0 here on Schilling. We saw briefly that graphic of Schilling's numbers against the Yankees in the 2001 World Series. They were eye popping. Masada showing bunt. This obviously isn't a spot where he would bunt. Ball one down and in. The only mitigating circumstance in that is you wonder how well Schilling would bounce off the mound if. The Yankees were to lay one down, but they want Posada to swing the bat. Right. Here's a 1 0. Bellhorn to end the inning. Two nothing Yankees after one. Kurt Schilling takes a seat in the dugout. He gave up two runs in the first inning. Mike Messina going to work. He had a perfect first inning. And the Red Sox, who are actually favored in this series, trail 2 0 after one. It's Ortiz, Millar, and then Nixon. David Ortiz has had a couple of fantastic years in a Red Sox uniform. 301 average. Tied for second in the AL with 41 home runs. 139 RBI, second best total in the American League. One ball, two strikes. That's where American League pitchers try to pitch David inside on the hand. You drop that ball down about six inches, that's his power slot. But if you go inside, you want to stay on the hand. Messina has controlled David Ortiz, who is a career 0 69 hitter against the Yankee right hand. A 1 2. 2 and 2. You're right, Timmy, and it makes sense for Ortiz to have two great years in Boston. You have Fenway Park with the Green Monster, very shallow. He's a guy who wants the ball out over, but he doesn't hook and pull. He stays on the ball and goes to left field, like he did with the game winning home run against Anaheim. You got to stay inside on him. The 2 2. Just got a piece. That's one of the things they used to say about Mo Vaughn in a Boston Red Sox uniform, a guy who was a left handed batter, but loved to pound that Green Monster. He has the same way. Two balls, two strikes. Now full count. There are several traits about a guy like David Ortiz, who's a good low ball hitter, which means he's a good off speed hitter, but it also means that you can pitch him tight. Guys who like the ball down are not as inclined to get around on the ball inside as high ball hitters. Ortiz chops it to the right side. Olrut, Messina. They've worked on that since the middle of February. <laughs> Whether it's Olrut and Messina or any first baseman and pitcher combination across baseball. We look at the defense for the New York Yankees. See how they cover the field. It's brought to you by State Farm. Matsui, Williams, Sheffield, Rodriguez, Jeter. See what he's done in his career in ALCS play. Cairo, 
Olrude with Posada <laughs> catching Messina. Four have been to the plate, and four have been retired. Here's Millar. Strike one. Millar has feasted on Yankee pitching. Last eight games against the Yankees, hitting 513 out of 26 with four home runs. The 0 1. Left side from the hole. It's Cheater. Long throw. Nothing to it. Two out. Third baseman like Rodriguez ranges as far to the left as he can. But Jeter backing up the play. A-Rod just keeps right on going to clear the path for Jeter. Relatively easy play. It's good to see Jeter finally not look nervous in the postseason. <laughs> He is as cool as they get. And this Yankee run started with, I say, very little coincidence when he popped on the scene in 96. Here's a pitch up and in ball one. And it may be October, but you never know. It looks like the middle of April on his face. Jeter, a guy who has two of the calmest eyes under pressure of any athlete I've seen. Nixon pops it up left side. Messina off to a perfect start. Those calm eyes help Jeter pull it in. One, two, three, go the Red Sox in the second. The Yankees got a couple in the first. Matt Suey drove in the first. And then it was Bernie Williams. On the strength of that, the Yanks up 2 nothing after an inning and a half. John Olrood starts it for New York. Bottom to second. 2 0 Yankees on top. Cairo and Lofton will follow against Kurt Schilling. There are the numbers this postseason for Olrood. One ball, one strike. Olrood ended up playing in 49 games with the Yankees after they picked him up. The Mariners cut him loose and hit 280. Compared to what's Happened tonight to what happened during the entire World Series action for Schilling against the Yankees. As that pitch was at the very bottom of the strike zone there, and now Olrood in the hole one and two. Here's a patient hitter. Former Tom. teammate of yours, Al. Yes, in two places, Toronto and with the Mets. A great guy. Trying to get something started for the Yankees on one and two. Just spoiling it. Well, if my math is right, 21 pitches in the first inning, uh, five innings, he'd have 105 pitches. So what do you think? So far, so good if you talk about the Yankees in our open. Trying to be patient, trying to work the count, trying to get the pitch count for Schilling up. They did so and picked up two runs in the first inning. That is just inside. Schilling doesn't get the call again. And it's two and two. Okay, the key hit in that first inning is that double by Matt Sewer. You can't hit that pitch. You're not supposed to hit that pitch for a hit. Unless you flare it somewhere, you cannot put the good part of the bat on the ball, but somehow he did. Allroot gets a rip, but grounds it right at Bellhorn. One out. But one out, nobody on Cairo. Miguel Cairo, his numbers against Minnesota, but his last 33 games is hitting 330. Lofton to follow. The Red Sox plan on using four starters in this ALCS against the Yankees. That means that Schilling is slated for games one and five, and he'd be hanging around if needed. If this thing were to go seven. That's Ramirez to his right, two out. As opposed to what the Diamondbacks did in the 2001 World Series where they had to bring Schilling back two times on short rest. With 
two out the base is empty here's Lofton. There are just some pitches that are thrown by pitchers that are designed to get a guy out and that's one of them right there. I mean that's an extraordinary job of hitting by Hideki Matsui. Ford is really lucky. <laughs> uh, I think, you know why I think it's more than luck? He hit the ball hard. It was a flare. That wasn't off the end of the bat or off the handle. First pitch is strike to Lofton, who's in the lineup tonight. Because of a little seven for 23 against Schilling. Don't punch me. That's strike two. Don't fear McCarver. No. Come on. Lofton getting the start is the D.H. Sierra who was one of the heroes in their clincher game four of the division series against Minnesota's on the bench. Here's the 0 2. They wanted it high. Veritek got it high from Schilling and goodbye to Lofton. After two in Yankee Stadium Red Sox will come to the plate trailing by two. Mike Messina has been perfect through two. Veritek, Cabrera, and Bill Miller. Bottom three in the lineup for the Red Sox. Don't be fooled by the fact that they're the bottom three in this lineup. It is tough top to bottom for Boston. And the first pitch is a strike to Veritek. There are his numbers during the postseason. And here's a guy who did not have a hit at Yankee Stadium all season. 0 for 34. 18 strikeouts along the way one ball one strike and this is a guy Al that Tim and I have remarked over the past couple of years any team would love to have a switch hitting catcher a leader an absolute rock behind the plate and he's a guy who has had one big hit after another for the Red Sox in his time there who every pitcher on this staff appreciates and cares about so much I was talking with Dave Wallace the pitching coach for the Red Sox and saying he takes every pitch and scatter report sits down with the pitcher pitchers and realizes hey we're in this together I'm going to call a good game well, let's execute three balls and a strike from Messina and every every pitcher that's all you could ask for is for a catcher who really gets into understanding that if you're not going to get hits contribute behind the plate he was right in the middle of two bench clearing brawls between these two teams this season as he floats one into left for round number one. And with one out, Veritek heads back to the dugout. The number eight hitter Cabrera will come to the plate. Throughout the league championship series, we're going to identify a key matchup in the game and determine who holds the direct TV advantage. We compare the last two years of the Yankees and the Red Sox. They've met 45 times and you see how evenly split those games are 23 22 Red Sox but the Red Sox and their fans couldn't care less about that top figure all they are hung up on it with good reason is four wins for the Yankees three wins for the Red Sox in last year's ALCS here's Cabrera takes a strike Orlando with a huge hit in game two of the division series out in Anaheim. One ball, one strike. Good news for Yankee fans. They have very valuable Rivera back. We'll go to Kenny Albert in just a moment to hear more about that. So far, one strikeout for Mike Messina. That ball is foul. Is it playable for Old Root? It is. Too long. We welcome Kenny Albert to the broadcast. Kenny. Well, Joe, Mariano Rivera landed at Teterboro Airport in northern New Jersey, and he arrived here at Yankee Stadium just moments ago. Now, during the pregame introductions, Bob Shepard, the longtime public address announcer, announced to the crowd that en route from the airport, number 42, Mariano Rivera, and the crowd went nuts. But he is here at Yankee Stadium. Thanks, Kenny. Yeah, that was... I would say outside of maybe Jeter the loudest cheer that any Yankee received was just for the news that Rivera was on his way here had to deal with family tragedy down in Panama his wife's cousin and his son 
died in a freak swimming pool accident. He had to go down there, grieve with the family, take care of business. They had the funeral today, and he flew in and just arrived. First pitch is strike to Bill Miller. Batting in the number nine position. He takes another 0 2. We do not know yet whether Mariano Rivera is emotionally capable of entering the game later on. One would assume that he is since he's here and will suit it up. But if Asuna keeps throwing like he's been throwing, the Yankees aren't going to need a short relief. Ball one up and away. Messina has made four game one starts for the Yankees. So far, he's 0 and 4. And that includes a tough luck loss to Minnesota game one of the division series a week ago. Miller pops it up. Can't do any better than Messina the first three innings. Jeter. Red Sox again go in order. Gary Sheffield is due up third in the bottom of the third. 2 0 New York. Top of the order for the Yankees, Jeter, Rodriguez, and Sheffield. Derek Jeter flying to right his first time up. Schilling got into first inning two out trouble. Sheffield doubled. Matsui doubled on a nasty pitch. And then Bernie Williams drove home Matsui. The only run so far tonight. Ball one to Jeter. The Yankees have lost game one of their last four postseason series. Lead here tonight, 2 0. In the center, leadoff hit for Jeter. Here's A Rod. That was an identical slider that Gary Sheffield hit. Sheffield's was up a little bit more. But that breaking ball of Schilling thus far is just rolling up there. There's no bite to it. Good pitch there, and Rodriguez misses it, strike one. Everybody said Alex Rodriguez had to prove himself in the postseason. In his first season with the Yankees, and he certainly did against Minnesota. Peter on to start the inning. Rodriguez plunks one to the left side in the hole. Cabrera throws across. Too late. Infield hit. Two on. Nobody out. Too much to do for Orlando Cabrera. He had too far to range. Jumping and the throw toward the home plate side. And Millar misses the tag. So an infield hit for Rodriguez, and that brings Gary Sheffield to the plate. With two on and nobody out. <laughs> Fastball for strike one. Bothered by that right ankle, not able to drive, and a lot of these pitches are staying up. Although they said his ankle has been bothering him for the most part of the season, so I, I don't want to use it as an excuse or anything like that, but I think it's been bothering him for a while. A 1 1. Up again, it's 2 1. For power pitch, you got to really work the backside, and if it is bothering him as much as what's been said, he's got to be able to push off. And it looks right now he's very timid on the backside and not being able to push off. But for Schilling, he's got to have his backside. He's got to use his legs better than what that would show. Two balls and a strike on Sheffield. Schilling in third inning trouble falls further behind. 
which would probably explain Kurt Schilling gets right-handed batters 60% of the time he throws fastballs 20% of the time he uses his split 7% of his slider and curve and my point is that if he's using his curveball and slider more often than his split he's either not feeling comfortable or something is wrong behind on the count to Sheffield three and one and that's a strike on the outside corner full count Sheffield thought that ball may have been outside you can see Veritek setting up over the middle of the plate a lot of times when a catcher has to move like that hitters can see that but he was setting up inside that pitch was a strike send the runners here they're going Sheffield hits it down the left field line into the corner Ramirez gives it a look and it's a foul ball short of that 318 mark and just out of the reach of Manny Ramirez but the runners are going here as Joe Torre starts the runners if you're Boston and you're showing you have to hope for a strike him out throw him out chance here this is a golden opportunity for the Yankees. The best of all worlds would be a line drive at an infielder. They're going again. Sheffield walks. Schilling is he prepares as good as well as any pitcher in baseball as far as video and everything else these are splits that ball is supposed to be inside just like the pitch prior to the foul ball it was supposed to be a split inside and he's yanking it it's two things either something wrong physically or you're out of whack or out of sync mechanically and he's off and he's in trouble and so are the Red Sox here in game one back-to-back -back singles a walk and here is Matsui down the right field line, hooked into the corner and off the wall. One run scores. Here comes A Rod. Sheffield all the way around. It's a three run double. in the Bronx. Trot Nixon slip. Otherwise, Sheffield doesn't even try to score. Luis Soho, a nice play at third base by sending Sheffield with nobody out. Ball off the wall, the slip right there. Jeter Rodriguez score easily. Sheffield in the bottom of your screen being waved home by Luis Soho. Bedlam here in the Bronx. And Sheffield fired up in this game one against Boston. That was a backdoor cutter that Schilling missed by two feet. But like, Matsui didn't. Still nobody out. Matsui at second and Bernie Williams at the plate. for the Red Sox in their bullpen. At the most basic level of pitching, the fastball from Schilling doesn't look like it has great zip on it. It's flat. A 1-0. 2-0. I don't know if it's too early to, to think about it. But I think the strategy of Terry Francona perhaps changes now. If you get Schilling out of there, trust the bullpen to hold him down and come back. You're not giving the game away. But that way you can bring him back in game four as he started. Right now he's scheduled for game five. Two balls and a strike. But if the ankle is bothering him, or if there is something physically wrong to the point that Schilling is pitching the way he is here in game one. How anxious are you to get him back on the mound for game four? I'm very anxious and I'll take my chances. Two balls and a strike with a runner at second. Nobody out. That advances the runner to third. Bellhorn 
Good play for the first out. We take a look at Kurt Schilling previously in the postseason, whether it's been the Philadelphia Phillies, great year with the Arizona Diamondbacks, or even what he did in game one of the division series against Anaheim. He has been a warrior. He has been a horse. And tonight, he has been hittable and behind a lot of hitters. Runner at third, one out, and the infield has to come in. Posada at the plate. Strike one. Glenn Jones moves the outfielders around trying to get Manny Ramirez attention. Posada on a line into center. The catch by Damon. It's six nothing Yankees here in the third. is empty two out Olrud will be the hitter the first four reach and all four have come around to score the Red Sox who have faith in their offense have yet to have a base runner but if there's one team that you know won't panic down six nothing even in this atmosphere it's the Boston Red Sox you think back to July 24th when Bill Miller hit a three-run home run to win it, 11 to 10. Red Sox were down by seven in that game at one time. Here's a 2-0. 3-0. Kurt Schilling, as we heard in our pregame show, that I'm not sure I can think of any scenario more enjoyable than making 55,000 people from New York shut up. Not tonight. Here's a 3-0. A two-out walk. Second walk of the inning and of the evening for Schilling. I think you get him out of there if you're Terry Francona. Maybe allow him to pitch to Miguel Cairo. Lofton on deck, the left-handed hitter. If you don't get him out of there, I think you're thinking about getting him out of there. Maybe one more hitter. Mike Myers, a lefty, is the one getting loose with the left-handed hitting Lofton on deck. So you would figure this would be it either way. One ball, no strikes on Cairo. So you're conceding the game? Is that what that is? No, I'm not. I'm conceding the fact that Kurt Schilling should be out of the game. I'm not conceding anything. You Come on, brother. Would you leave him in there, Al? No. So you're conceding the game? <laughs> <laughs> Two and oh is the count on Cairo. Chant of Who's Your Daddy was heard moments ago from this crowd at Yankee Stadium. A wide strike to make it two and one. It's a reference to what Pedro Martinez said about a month ago after his start against the Yankees. So what can I say? I just tip my hat. Call the Yankees my daddy. He will be on the mound tomorrow night. For the Red Sox taking on John Lieber. 58th pitch of the night is coming right now in the third inning from Schilling. Clearly, his ankle has to be tolerated. Sure I haven't seen like. many fastballs that were in Kurt Schilling range. No, yeah. hop. He's huh? 89, 90 miles an hour yeah. at the most. The 2 2. Cairo into center field will send Damon back. And the inning is finally 
over. Little Blue Oyster Cult for you. They called him Godzilla in Japan. And he has been a Red Sox killer this season. It continues in October. 6 0 Yankees after three. Mike Messina will head through this lineup again. He was perfect the first time. Nine in a row retired, and it's Johnny Damon who struck out in his first at bat. And Bellhorn and Manny Ramirez, six to nothing. The Yankees on top. And a ball outside. After that last half inning, Dave Wallace, an arm around his number one starter. Kurt Schilling, who is likely finished for the night with more action for the Red Sox out in their bullpen. Yeah, Kurt uh, Laskanik was throwing at the end of the third inning. Then he sat down, oh, leaving yeah. us to believe that perhaps Schilling would continue, but now Laskanik back up. Damon trying to become the first base runner of the night for the Red Sox in the hole one and two. If you haven't noticed, Johnny Damon has solidified his spot as one of the best leadoff hitters in the game. How about 94 RBIs? He had 20 home runs, had an average over 300, and was sixth in the American League with 189 hits. Also stole 19 bases. Two and two. Thing that makes him such a tough out is unlike most hitters with two strikes, Damon is a threat. Half of those 189 hits were with two strikes on him. He led the majors with two strike hits. He had 90 of them this year. Trying to get one here. And he is able to wait and lay off that pitch full count. This season, Johnny Damon has accomplished all of this. Second most runs in the American League, 20 home runs, a career high. 355 average with runners in scoring position. A lot of pop, a lot of production out of the leadoff spot. For Terry Francona. That's on the inside corner, one out. You got a six run lead and can thread the needle like that. That's doing something. Front corner. So Damon strikes out for the second time tonight. Here's Bellhorn. Bellhorn hit it rather hard in the first inning, but lined out to Bernie Williams in center. Ball one. Mike Messina in his fourth year with the Yankees. Timing has been such that Messina is still searching for his first ring. And there's no doubt that he is the guy this season in the rotation for the Yankees. This postseason, he does not have the backup that he had last year with Wells. He was in San Diego. Clemens with the Astros. Same for Pettit. The count goes to two and one on Bellhorn. Only one active pitcher has thrown more innings than Mike Messina and not received a world championship ring. Jamie Moyer of Seattle. With one out, a two one pitch to Bellhorn. Kenny. Well, Joe, in his last four starts, Mike Messina has been matched up with Pedro Martinez twice and Johan Santana twice. He said yesterday facing other top of the rotation starters helps him prepare for games such as tonight's. Thanks, Kenny. And he's matched up tonight against Kurt Schilling. 3 1 pitch. Full count. That was one of the few hittable balls that the Red Sox have had. A 3 1 fastball right down the pipe. Well, the score has a lot to do with that. The 3-1 count, he's not trying to walk him. He's going to go outer half, the like he did. Perhaps Bellhorn missed it. But the most difficult thing in a, in a, in a disparity of a 6-0 game like this is that Lucino, whoever's on the, on the low end of it, has to continue to pitch. Damon's on the outside corner, back-to-back, -back, called third strikes with Damon and Bellhorn. 
The League Championship Series on Fox brought to you by Budweiser. Grab a cold, fresh Budweiser. It's game time. Went inside to Damon and away to Bellhorn. Two out. After that 3-1 cookie that Bellhorn fouled back outside part of the plate. That really was the corner pitch. That was outside half. That's our direct shot of home plate from center field. That's what you hear on Fox as Ramirez gets a good swing with strike one. Generally speaking, if your team trails by six or seven runs in the middle eight innings, it's easier to hit because more pitches become predictable. And in that instant there with a down 6-0, you'd think Manny would take a strike or get into the count, but Manny swings at 15% of the time the first pitch counts. He's the highest first pitch swinger on this Boston team. Even with the score 6 nothing, and he almost walked right into that pitch. And he didn't go. Says Jeff Nelson, the first base umpire, and the count evens at one and one. Man, he was lunging out there, and the pitch stayed up and in. Lost his balance. But able to keep the bat back, and there's Dave Wallace on the phone of the bullpen again. Here's a 1 1 on the outside corner, 1 and 2. You put those two pitches back to back, they belong to together. The up and in fastball, and then the fastball low and away. Textbook pitching, yes, sir. Trying to strike out the side is Messina here in the fourth. And he does. Says a lot. Six nothing, New York. Kurt Schilling's night is finished after going three innings, allowing six runs on six hits. The new pitcher for Boston is Curtis Lescanic. Lescanic takes over and deals with Lofton, then Jeter, then Rodriguez. That's why two and zero. Oh. Les Canik part of a deep bullpen for the Red Sox. They have Wakefield down there if they need him. Derek Lowe, Mendoza, who they added for this round. 3 0 on Lofton. They also have Arroyo down there. In the right situation, they bring him in. And you look at the final numbers for Kurt Schilling, and there's no doubt that that right angle was bothering him. Shortest postseason outing ever for Kurt Schilling. And the Yankees lead 6 0. Here's a 3 1. Full count. The rotation set for the Red Sox is Pedro Martinez tomorrow, Brandon Arroyo for game three, and then Tim Wakefield for game four. But because of the early exit, the Red Sox do have the luxury, if you will, to bring it back. Schilling for game four and keeping Wakefield in the bullpen. I don't know whether they'll do that, but now this short outing, I mean, they're trying to just see whether the glass is half full instead of half empty. Three balls, two strikes on Lofton. Another foul. You talk to Terry Francona, the manager of the Red Sox. He says, don't make the mistake of thinking that the ankle flared up only on Kurt Schilling his last time out. He's pitched with it for a while. But the way that Schilling's stuff looked tonight, you wonder how much that ankle was bothering him after we showed you that highlight of the late inning play where he had to come off the mound to his left and on the line, made the play, then went down and grabbed that right ankle. Certainly a fair point. If that is the case. What would his status be for the rest of this series? Here's a 3 2. A leadoff walk. A leadoff walk. 
And they're paying close attention to Lofton, who stole seven bases during the regular season. The Houston Astros enter the league championship series as hot as the Red Sox were coming into this game tonight. However, they won't be able to use Roger Clemens and Roy Oswalt until games three and four of that series. Instead, it'll be Brandon Backey, who has really pitched well for Houston. His number is five and three. Pitched well already in the divisional series against Atlanta. Woody Williams got a victory in game one of the division series against the Dodgers. You see his career numbers against the Astros, nine and four. He's from the Houston area. That's tomorrow at 8 Eastern. They're on Fox or on your FSN affiliate. One is the count on Jeter and more attention paid to Lofton over at first. Well, if this is ever a, a spot to show the respect of the, what the Yankees have for the Red Sox offense, here Jeter tried to bunt to move Lofton to second, put him in scoring position with a six zero lead. Probably remembering that game on July 24th when they had the seven run lead and lost it 11 to 10 on the three run homer by Miller. And even if you don't want to bunt, you get that big hole on the right side of the infield, and Jeter loves to go that direction. Start the runner Lofton. Counts one ball, one strike. Strike two on Jeter. 93 miles per hour from Les Cannon. Whitey Herzog, the ex-manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, said once when I think Lee Elia, who was managing the Cubs at the time, said Whitey was running when he was way ahead. He said, I wouldn't send them if he promised not to score anymore. <laughs> that was Roger Craig of the Giants. Was it Roger yeah. of the Giants? <laughs> Jeter checks it two and two. I'll stop running as long as you promise not to score anymore. And a lot of those old unwritten rules have been thrown right out the window with the offensive explosion that has hit baseball over the last 10, 15 years. Two balls, two strikes. Lofton drew a leadoff walk. As Canick deals to Cheater. And that almost got Cheater on the thigh, full count. Derek just out of the way, and I would imagine Joe Torrey will send Lofton here. Again, the Yankees with a six-run lead, but we're only in the fourth inning. Boston on the other side of it has yet to get a man on base against Messina. Kenny Lofton looking at first base coach Roy White to catch the wink. He's going on ball four, so Les Canick has come out of the bullpen and walked the first two. What that means is if you're the runner on at first base and you're unsure whether you're going or not, just peek over the first baseman's shoulder and the first base coach will give you a wink. Two eyes hit and run, one eye, you're going. Of course, there, 3-2 pitch. And you could clearly see Lofton flashing those bulbs toward Roy White. And Roy obviously winked at him. So here on the 12th of October, Kenny Lofton doesn't know the sign. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I mean, that's the way it happened right there. Well, he's also given a spot to look in and see what Eric is doing. They, they, they try to get the catcher sleeping a little bit and looking in to see if he can get it off speed with some run on. With two on and nobody out. Alex Rodriguez hits a slow roll at a short, and they still turn two. Nicely turned by Cabrera and Bellhorn. That ball wasn't hard hit at all. And it's a 6 4 3 double play. When a hitter gets jammed, he doesn't get out of the box well enough, and the Red Sox take advantage of it. A quick shuffle by Cabrera, and nicely turned by Bellhorn. I didn't think they had a chance for two on that play. Either. And they just got Rodriguez at the wire, and now it's Sheffield, who has doubled and scored, walked and scored. Bottom of the fourth inning, Yankees already leading 6 nothing. looking for more, and Sheffield takes a strike.
one ball, one strike. It was canning. This was the furthest thing from his mind. He was going to come into the game in the fourth inning with Schilling on the mound in game one. And here he is trying to pitch around back to back walks to start this fourth. Sheffield tried to hold up, could not, one and two. Pedro Martinez and John Lieber in game two. So far the Yankees are getting all they could have hoped for from Messina who in the fifth inning will deal with Ortiz Millar and Nixon. A one two on his hands. That swing right there was one of those hit it before it hits you. It did, but it, it, it's an indication of how quickly Gary Sheffield can spin on that ball inside. Lofton the runner at third, two out. And Sheffield took the ball two, two and two. Are you sure? They're calling it ball two. It looked pretty good from up here. And Les Canick did a little extra hop at the end, not getting that pitch. Let's take a look from dead on center field. Pitch right down the middle. Ball two. It must have been too hard. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. So Sheffield gets an extra pitch at least. To try to hammer from Les Canick. Runner at third, two down, and that's too wide. Full count. Merrill Mendoza getting loose for Boston. Got that guy lingering on deck again. The guy with four RBIs, two doubles. Matsui. The Yankees are obviously without Giambi. Not on the roster for the division series or for the LCS. The Yankees move on. Don't expect him to be on the active roster for the World Series either. Matsui has been cleaning up. Sheffield strikes out. That'll do it. Les Canick gets around the two walks. Six nothing. Back after this from your local Fox Station. First pitch is in for a strike to David Ortiz. So far, no base runners for the Red Sox. And Messina along the way has made some perfect deliveries. The inside part and the outside part, changing speeds, controlling his breaking ball, a sip on his fastball. He's one and one on Ortiz, who grounded out to the right side his first time up. And one of those keys, Joe, to get Three Red Sox in a row at the top of the order, taking a call third strike. Damon, Bellhorn, Ramirez. Here's a 1 1. Off the hands, 1 and 2. More moose calls for Mike Messina here in the fifth. Messina so far has made it look very easy against a very dangerous Red Sox lineup. Ortiz vulnerable inside right now. Best time to jam a hitters with two strikes. It wouldn't take much for the Red Sox to feel better about themselves tonight if they could figure out how to break through against Messina. And this lineup can put up runs in a blink. Messina making Ortiz wait. David has waited long enough. 
call the fastball away there. Moose certainly knows what he has going on here with the uh, four ratings of the baseball. You think it's already crept into his mind? Absolutely. The 2 2. Pitching in the fifth, and he has been perfect to this point. Sada called fastball away. 2 1 count, and a 6 0 lead. Probably a safe pitch down and away. It's a base hit to left, but with a no hitter going on right now, and I know it's only the fifth inning. You want to come inside? Knuckle curve again. On two and two. Ortiz takes ball three. Cena has flirted with perfection, taking perfect games into the ninth inning twice throughout his career. Fastball inside. On three and two. Four consecutive strikeouts. And it has been as easy as ABC from Mike Messina. Three call third strikes in the fourth inning. Five strikeouts overall. He's established his fastball. He's thrown his knuckle curve for called strikes, and then he's able to expand. And that's exactly what he's been doing. Now it's Millar at the plate. <laughs> There's another pitch on the corner, this time the inside corner to Kevin Millar. Thinking about that perfect game right now. You right out. It's 0 2. He is really taking charge in the fifth inning, coming out and shaking off Posada at will. That's the way it should be. But Messina, very, very aggressive right now. He is pitching like it's a 1 0 game. Down and away, one ball, two strikes, and I would imagine, guys, that not only has to do with what the scoreboard reads, with nothing but zeros for the Red Sox, but how Messina feels, and he feels terrific tonight. That's obvious. You Jam feel Millar. You feel much better with a six-run lead. I would imagine. A little more relaxed on that 2 0 fastball outer half. Another 1 2 offering from the scene into Millar. And he got him to go. Another strikeout and another out. Scooter tells us about the curveball. Scooter, you know, a sweeping curveball can save my gorgeous face from getting smacked. I scoop from one side of the plate to the other and drop down at the same time. So remember, a sweeping curveball sweeps right over home plate. And Scooter, it does curve. In the case with Mucina, there's a knuckle curveball. Guys learn very at a young age to get this finger off the ball. And mostly the pressure's on your middle finger. And so long as you're on top of the ball and you come through with the pitch, it'll have tumbling effect. Mike Mucina has a great knuckle curve. So now with two out and nobody on, more who's your daddy from this crowd, and that is five consecutive strikeouts. Here, see, see his index finger off the ball. He's across what is considered the two seam part of the fast or off the ball, and it's all off his middle finger. Making very good hitters look bad tonight. Another perfect inning and a perfect night so far from Messina. Halfway through game one, six nothing New York. Joe Torre, Willie Randolph, who, by the way, 
received permission, as did the Mets today, from the Yankees organization. And Willie Randolph talked to the New York Mets about their managerial position. We saw Brian Cashman before the game, and he granted permission. And Joe Torre and the Yankees have been talking about Willie Randolph deserving that opportunity, and hopefully for Willie that will come along. Bottom of the fifth inning. Hideki Matsui is at the plate and he's driven home four runs tonight. Off the end of the bat, Ramirez back on the track. For round number one with the new pitcher Mendoza in the middle of the diamond for the Red Sox. And that gets a smile and a sigh of relief from Ramirez. Ramiro Mendoza, a former Yankee. When you talk about being locked in at Matsui. He hit an unhittable pitch in the first inning. He had a rocket that hit the wall to drive in three runs and clear the bases. And he hit that ball off the end of the bat to the wall. Three great at bats by the former Japanese superstar Hideki Matsui. Bernie Williams is one for two with an RBI single and a ground out. Ball one. Mendoza was added to the active roster as Mariano Rivera gets a great reaction from these very aware fans here at Yankee Stadium. It's been a rough couple of days for Mariano and his family. From his setup, right hander Tom Gordon. Two balls and a strike on Bernie Williams. He just asked the question on the bullpen what's happened so far. A two run first and a four run third. Kurt Schilling lasted only three. Hideki Matsui has had a big night. Bernie Williams has one of the other two RBIs, Posada the other. Here's a 3 1 for Mendoza. Two hops for Bellhorn, two out. Last half full action for you, Tim and Al. Red Sox are going to get a chance to get some work for some of the relievers. Whether it's Mendoza now or maybe Wakefield next. Wakefield hasn't pitched since the end of the regular season and he's getting loose out of the bullpen after Schilling could last only three. Posada hit on the foot and the lower leg and he's on with two out. That was a breaking ball hitting Mendoza's former battery mate, Jorge Posada. I think it could point out, Joe, you know, of course, Wakefield can actually hit his front foot. I think that what, what that points out is that Schilling could go in game four. Or Wakefield can, I mean, Wakefield can pitch every other day. He's on that knuckleball. So he's the most flexible guy on Peter's staff. Terry Francona certainly realizes how important he's been for the Red Sox. Well, it's the obvious question that's hanging over the first three innings of this game. If you ask Kurt Schilling how he feels, and if he would want the ball in game four and game five, you know what the answer is before you ask. Of course, send me out there, skip on your guy. But the statistics and the facts of what happened in the first three innings and the evidence that he presented with the pitches that he threw up there, the kind of zip and the lack of control and would tell you that maybe there's something more serious with that ankle than we were all led to believe going into this game or that Schilling let on. So I think his status, whether they want to talk about it in those terms after tonight's game, is at this point very much up in the air the rest of this series. You can't just automatically say, well, sure, he'll take the game ball in game four or five after what he presented here in game one. As Olrud hits it off the end of the bat, and that baby's going to drop in. Everything going right for the Yankees tonight. Even Posada going first to third with two out. It's 
just sink her down and away. John going with it like he's done for 10, 12 years. And it's very, very uh, reminiscent of what I've seen as a teammate in many years. You guys with me on that last thing? Or not? Well, I, I just think that it gives the, the, the Red Sox the flexibility to come back with him in game four and then game seven. I don't know how serious the ankle is. Certainly from the way through tonight, it was hurting him tonight. But it gives them the flexibility. I mean, they, they can do it. I mean, if it, Kurt Schilling, even though he didn't prove it tonight, at 85% is better than most guys at 100%. And he certainly didn't prove that tonight, but that's something I think the Red Sox have to determine over the next several days. Two hours of count. Well, I think the conversation is moot. The really the the answer needs to be as to what is wrong with him. Is he is he masking it? Is this shot really covering something that's much more serious? And I'm with you, Joe. If if he's really bad and he's throwing 88 mile hour fastballs for a guy who throws 95. Is he really that helpful to come back in three days? I don't think so. Two balls, no strikes. First and third, two out. Cairo is trying to go the other way with a pitch out over the plate. It's two and one. It's just going to be so difficult, I think, for the Red Sox to determine because it's not a broken bone. It's a situation where he's trying to pitch with it. And in the end, it's going to be left up to Schilling. And the question, how do you feel? Can you pitch? And I think we all know what his answer would be because of the kind of competitor he is and the kind of guy he has proven to be in the big leagues. Give me the ball. I want to go pitch and I want to help my team win. Well, he beat the Angels in game one, giving up three runs in seven innings. I mean, you have to take that into consideration if you're going to take the, the game tonight into consideration. But he injured, he tweaked that ankle at the end of that outing. Right. And you right. wonder how severe that really was reaching down and grabbing that ankle and if that had a lingering effect into tonight and if that will continue throughout this series but he certainly didn't throw tonight in any way shape or form like he threw in game one against no, Anaheim no way so the question is why and if it's the ankle then who knows where his position will be the rest of this series Three balls, two strikes, first and third, two out. Runner goes, line drive to Cabrera, and the inning is over. A hit batsman, a base hit, two left in the inning, five on the night for the Yankees. The focus on Messina. Head back to work in the sixth. Sixth inning, and so far, no base runners for the Red Sox. Harrington first up, and he takes a strike. Baratek, Cabrera, and Miller, the bottom three in the lineup for Boston. That is hammered foul. Along with our producer, Pete Macheska, our director, Bill Webb, Joe Buck. Now lighter, Tim McCarver with you. Game one of this ALCS, and it's been all New York. Two runs in the first, four runs in the third. It's the sixth inning now, and Mike Messina has not allowed a base run. Baratek fly to left his first time up. Ball one. Talk about odds. Jason Veritek is 0 for 35 at Yankee Stadium this year, and Mike Messina has a perfect game in the sixth inning. He's also struck out 18 times here this year. Messina has him set up at a ball and two strikes. Messina has struck out six, including five in a row. Baratek is gone, and that's strikeout number seven. Knuckle curveball now is able to expand. You stay ahead, use your fastball. Like Tim said earlier with the scouting report, four corners with Lucina's fastball. Now they have to be defensive. And in this case, how, how quickly this curveball is dropping. It's a defensive swing. Just like bingo. 
four, four corners from Messina. And bingo, he has pitched some game, I'll tell you. With one out and nobody on, here is Cabrera. That is wide for ball one. That's the last time he played bingo. Uh, about 35 years ago. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> With the bases empty and one out, a 1-0 pitch. Orlando Cabrera takes wide again, 2-0. This pitch right here will say a lot whether Boos thinks he's got a shot at no hitter. This is a fastball hitter to fastball count, 2-0. It's interesting that Orlando Cabrera made the last out in the last perfect game pitched here at Yankee Stadium against David Cohn on July 19, 1999. Here's a 2-1. Cabrera pops it into shallow right. Here comes Sheffield, two out. The near perfect game that Mike Messina pitched on September 2nd, 2001 at Fenway Park. Did he ever have it working that night? But it was the 27th batter in that game came up and scored it for Messina. And it was Messina after the fact who said he was very aware of the situation in the middle part of the game and anybody, any pitcher who says he wasn't aware of Throwing a no hitter or a perfect game is lying. Well, if he was aware then, he's very aware now, too. <laughs> now you threw a no hitter in your career. And there's no doubt, I think you've been talking about it. It's pretty obvious that Messina's zeroed in. There's no doubt he is aware of what's going on around him. But what's nice about it, a game like this, it's similar to my no hitter against Colorado when I was with the Marlins because we won the game 11 to nothing. So it was clear that I knew I had to continue to pitch. Make pitches, throw backwards, fastball counts, throw curveballs, use my changeup in 11 to nothing game. And normally, if it wasn't a no hitter, you'd be more apt to just throw fastballs and put the ball in play. You had a cushion with which to work, right? It's a six run cushion here for Messina. He's trying to go perfect through six. Bill popped out his first time up. Just tap foul and it's still three and two and it was not a three two groove fastball. Well if, the, if that pitch right there doesn't tell you that he's thinking about a perfect game nothing will. A three two curveball with a six run lead in the sixth inning. No question about it. Seven strikeouts. Schilling now in the dugout watching. Cheering for Miller on three and two. And Miller pops it up. Matsui coming on. Messina perfect through six. Fourth pitcher of the night for Boston, it's Tim Wakefield. The knuckleballer who right now is scheduled to start game four and he is working with a catcher in Jason Baratek who doesn't typically catch him rarely catches him his usual battery mate is Doug Mirabelli. Hey, it's terrifying too <laughs> when, when you're not used to catching a knuckleball pitcher and all of a sudden in postseason play I don't care what the score is 
you're forced into that position. Nightmarish. Two balls and a strike on Lofton. The first action this postseason for Wakefield. Two and two. We've seen these catcher's mitts, whether it's Mirabelli or Veritek, they're bigger than a usual catcher's mitt. It's almost like a first baseman's mitt. The 2 2. Lofton cranks it down the right field line. That ball is gone for a home run. It's 7 to nothing. So Wakefield who gave up the series clinching home run to Aaron Boone in the 11th inning of game seven last year right here comes in in game one in relief and gives up a home run to the leadoff hitter Lofton to start the sixth. Derek Jeter will dig in. As Lofton gets his sixth. Calm down, folks. It was a knuckleball. You don't knock guys down with knuckleballs. Here's a 1 0. Up and in again. Two balls, no strikes. Had the Red Sox won last year's ALCS, the guy on the mound right now could very well have been the MVP of that series. Wakefield was different. Had to come on in relief and threw a knuckleball that didn't knuckle to Aaron Boone, and he ended it in game seven. Green one on Jeter. Rodriguez will follow and then Sheffield. Left side for Miller. Long throw. One up. As if Red Sox fans haven't seen it enough. Aaron Boone's homer that ended it. A memorable game, a memorable series. And you and I, Tim, were struck. By the raw emotion as you see Lofton take one out down the right field line against Wakefield. The raw emotion that we saw from Mariano Rivera at the end of that going out and basically just throwing himself on the mound here at Yankee Stadium. Excited that the Yankees had defeated the Red Sox. Rivera pitching three innings in that game. And Aaron Boone's biggest hit of his life. The guy at the plate is the man who replaced Aaron Boone. Boone injured himself playing pickup basketball in February. The Yankees cut him loose and then eventually made the deal with Texas to get Alex Rodriguez when the Red Sox and the Rangers couldn't get together on the money. About $12 million short. That's how it's reported. And Alex Rodriguez, even with the score 7 0, frustrated. With that strikeout. Two out for Sheffield. Sheffield has doubled, walked, struck out. That's 2 0 oh here. Is the inside corner two and one? Randy Marsh is the crew chief of this umpiring crew. He's behind the plate, and he says that's strike two. Base hit 
Sheffield left center field that thing scoots Ramirez cuts it off Sheffield will dig for second and make it with a two out double that'll bring in Hideki Matsui it also gives you today's web MD injury update focuses on Kurt Schilling's right ankle check your own symptoms with web MD's symptom checker at symptom.webmd.com and from the tendonitis in his right ankle shot of Marcane to these numbers three innings six runs on six hits two walks one thing you don't have to do if you throw a knuckleball is pitch around the hitter the knuckleball will pitch around the hitter naturally that's why they're not walking Matsui here Matsui's had three at bats he has a pair of doubles four RBIs two runs scored and the time he made an out he flew the ball to the wall in left field Ball one strike. The Red Sox in the seventh. We'll have the top of the order. Damon, Bellhorn, Ramirez. Hard hit. Another base hit for Matsui. Here comes Sheffield. They'll hold Matsui to a single. Another RBI, and that's five on the night. It's 8 nothing. Godzilla strikes again in New York. Oh, a breaking ball. Curveball. Down and in. That's pretty much where most left-handers like it. As much as Wakefield throws his knuckleball 60% of the time. Down in curveball. Strike one to Bernie Williams. Williams one for three with an RBI single and two ground outs. One and one. It's been the Matsui. The Cena show so far for the Yankees. Tying an ALCS record with his fifth RBI tonight as Williams went around strike two. Two high powered offenses, number one and two in the American League this season, producing runs. The Yankees are taking it to the Red Sox pitches. Nice running catch by Ramirez to end the sixth. We go to the seventh, top of the order, coming up for Boston. It's 8 nothing, New York. Mike Messina back for the seventh inning, facing Johnny Damon, who has had two at bats, two strikeouts. Strike one. Seven strikeouts on the night for Messina. most productive offense the American League has been completely shut down tonight by Mike Messina. Nobody scored more runs in this group. They hit 32 home runs this season against Yankee pitching. Tonight I would say only one hard hit ball and that was Bellhorn back in the first. If a guy breaks it up, it'll be a guy like Damon because he's such a good two strike hitter. Well, that pitch has been nasty to left handed hitters down and in, and he's had a lot of guys lunging. Well, it's so sharp. You're right, Joe. And many, many instances with a knuckle curve, when it comes out of the pitcher's hand, it looks like a fastball. Many times hitters will say they'll see the ball spit up over the pitcher's hand when it comes out as a curveball. With a knuckle curveball, it comes out almost like a fastball. That's why two and two. On 
two and two. Damon strikes out. Eight strikeouts for Messina. The knuckle curve out of the strike zone down gets Damon. Boost crossing. Now it's Bellhorn. Top of the seventh inning, game one. Yankees lead 8 0. Bellhorn, strike one. Back to the fastball. Strike two. Perfect game, both gone. Off the base of the wall, off the bat of Bellhorn, and these Yankee fans will let Messina hear it. I'm surprised at the selection. Here's a guy who struck out 177 times during the year. He had an 0-2 count. Clearly, Moose didn't want to throw it there. But you would think of expansive pitching with the off-speed as opposed to a fastball. I know he was trying to thread it away, but surprised at that pitch selection. It is about execution, and it was more outer half than off the plate. But as good as his knuckle curveball has been, I'm surprised at that selection. It goes as a one-out double for Bellhorn, and now Manny Ramirez. To the shortstop on two hops, Jeter. Two out. Some of the celebrities that are here with us tonight for game one. Nicholson, Danza, Henry Kraft, Billy Crystal. Tom Brokaw, Donald Trump. What's Donald been doing lately? I haven't seen much of him. Firing everybody. Runner at second, two out, and here's David Ortiz. By the way, forget all that Hollywood stuff with Nicholson. He's from Neptune, New Jersey, down the shore. You know what the boss says. That's the first Springsteen reference. And we're past the six inning point. I'm very impressed with you. What does he say? Down the shore, everything's all right. Me and my baby on a Saturday night. Runner at second, two out, one ball, no strikes. On Ortiz. Out in front, one and one. Yeah, it's Barry Clark near Neptune. I don't, I don't know. Is it near Neptune? That's, where, that's where he's from. It's a big rival. Asbury Park How and Neptune. I know that now. Right next to Talking to the king of Memphis over here. <laughs> I'm from Memphis, man. Actually, Bruce Springsteen went to Freehold High School and he makes a lot of references to Asbury Park. He's really from Freehold. Which is still a rival of Neptune. So says the man from Tom's River. Here's the 1 1. Ortiz into right field, a base hit. Bellhorn will hold up at third, down eight nothing. You cannot run into an out at the plate. And two hits in the seventh inning for Boston. At least trying to get up off the mat and get something done here. Flex their muscles before the end of game one. Yeah, to give them something to take into tomorrow. Brandon Arroyo against Pedro Martinez in game two tomorrow night. Did you know somebody at one point in your life named Brandon Arroyo? Bronson Arroyo. Oh, it's Bronson Arroyo, and he's not starting tomorrow night. No. No. So I was wrong on both counts. 
I was thinking of Neptune and Asbury Park. <laughs> the whole New Jersey conversation got you really it thrown out of whack. Got me flustered. It it's will be, Pedro. It will be John Leeper against Pedro tomorrow. There you go. No. Mel Stottlemyre is out to say, uh, Mike, look, I've been watching you all night, and I really haven't had anything to say to this point, so I just thought I'd make an appearance. Here's our Nissan game summary as we play here in the top of the seventh inning. The Red Sox threatening for the first time. Schilling lasting only three innings. Messina is into the seventh and still working. Matsui's had the big night with a bat. At the bottom, the Yankees have lost four straight game ones, but tonight, the eight to nothing in the seventh. Here's Millar with first and third, two out. Strike one. A one out double by Bellhorn, a two out single by Ortiz. Daniel Sturts getting loose for the Yankees. No matter the score, if you look at this series, the Yankees came into this game. They lost game one of the ALCS last year to the Boston Red Sox. But they're thinking, look, if we've got a sure bet, a guy that we can bank on giving us a good start. The scene has got to be the guy with all the question marks surrounding the back of the the back of Brown. Millar shoots it into left center field. Matsui won't get it. Off his glove, one run scores. Here comes Ortiz. It's a two out, two run double in an 8 2 game. Matsui almost got there, and Millar puts the Red Sox on the board. Well, Matsui touching this ball allows Ortiz to score. Had the ball hit the wall and bounced back, he retrieves it fast enough to hold Ortiz to third base. But because it hit his glove and was deflected toward left center field, Ortiz is waved around to score. So just to look ahead, you've got Lieber with a bad back. Although they say it's not going to be a factor. He's pitching in game two against Pedro Martinez. Then you've got Kevin Brown. As that pitch squirts away and Millar was on his toes. Goes over to third. And he's 90 feet away with two out. Kevin Brown with a broken left hand during the season. Clearly a, cl a cross up. Oh. There hasn't been too many people at second base. So maybe they use different signs. And Posada and Lucina. Have to get on the same page there, obviously. It's a pass ball and a cross up goes in the category of pass ball on a pitch that it's called a strike. Cena got the strike on that pitch, even though it got away. How many times do you get a strike on a wild pitch or a pass ball? Rarely. The one that hits the catcher in the chest. Wasn't caught. Here's a no one. Nixon with a base hit into center field. It's a three. This Red Sox lineup so good, top to bottom, front to back, and you wonder if that's going to be it for Messina. Veritek is digging in, and goodbye to Mike Messina, who carried a perfect game into this seventh inning. With one swing of the bat, the guy at the plate, Veritek, could make this a three run game. So Sturts pops out of that bullpen. As they salute Messina. First pitch from Sturts to Veritek is fouled out of play off to the left. And with all of the focus being on Mike Messina up to this point, the Red Sox have now chased him. They put three on the board, and they have a guy at the plate that's more than capable of making this with one swing, a three run game. Veritek during the regular season hit 18 home runs. High 
Miami Heat, 95 miles per hour, 0 and 2. I'm surprised John Olroot's holding Veritek on. You can almost play 10 feet behind Nixon with the quad problem Nixon has. He's not going anywhere. Veritek could pop one, hook one around Olroot. Veritek into right field. Back is Sheffield at the wall. Gone. Two run home run Veritek. And it's 8 5 here in the seventh. A five run seventh inning that still isn't over. And the Red Sox are right back in it. His first hit at Yankee Stadium this year. A two run shot by Veritek, who's now one for 37 in this ballpark. Boom, and the Red Sox are indeed back in this game. How about that? Which, if you want to go back to the fourth inning, if you want to go back to the fourth inning with Derek Jeter, when he tried to push Bond to move Lofton over, a six to zero lead, you knew that they had, they thought the capability of what the Red Sox are doing right now. I don't think there's any doubt, and they learned the hard way during the regular season. They were not putting this game in the win column already, and Mike Messina has gone from learning with history to sitting there sweating in the dugout bench as he hands it over to Sturts in this Yankee bullpen. We showed you earlier that Mariano Rivera is back in that bullpen. And he may very well be needed before the end of this night. Cabrera with two out and an 0-2 count. I think if you're Joe Torre, you're thinking Tom Gordon in the eighth, Mariano Rivera in the ninth. In the last inning, no way was he thinking that way. So Tanyan Sturge comes in, gives up the inherited runner, the ninth for Messina, six and two thirds, four runs on only four hits. No walks, eight strikeouts. He can only be the winner, but now it's up to the Yankee bullpen and the Red Sox. Doing exactly what they've done all year. They don't quit, they keep coming at you. And the top of the seventh inning is finally over, but not before the Red Sox officially climb our night and the Houston Astros visit the St. Louis Cardinals game one Brandon Backey against Woody Williams a five run seventh inning has put the Red Sox back in it they turn Posada around make a bat right handed strike one The Red Sox in the eighth will have Miller, Damon, and Bellhorn. The 0 1. One ball, one strike. With the addition of Keith Folk as the closer for the Boston Red Sox, the Red Sox like their bullpen better than they liked it a year ago in the LCS against the Yankees. Timlin was a part of it last year and he'll be a big part of it this year. The 1 1 pitch. Strike two. Posada tonight has been hit by a pitch. He's grounded out. He's hit a sack fly. His rip still one and two. Joe, you brought up an interesting point about tack on runs. A lot of times when a team has an eight nothing lead, you don't have a tendency to give the importance to that sixth, seventh, eighth run like you would when a team comes back and scores five runs. Well, the two runs that were scored against Wakefield are huge. And at the time, you don't think about it because right. nobody was even sniffing a hit against Messina. If you go back 75 years ago today, in the history books, you'll find the largest deficit overcome in postseason history. Eight runs, October 12, 1929. By the Philadelphia A's. The year the stock market crashed. 
Here's a 2 2 pitch. Embry is the fifth pitcher of the night for the Red Sox. I have not seen Gordon getting loose yet for the Yankees out of their bullpen, which is interesting. Yeah, I was a bit surprised at that myself. To the right side for Bellhorn. Stays down on it. One out. Well, you want to turn Posada around anytime you can get that chance. He has clearly more power from the right side, from the left side. And here with him being uh, turned around, you got Olerud, who they might have made, had to make a decision, and then you have Cairo at the bottom of the lineup with Lofton leading off as the number one hitter. I think that's the reason why he's not up here. Now here's Gordon at least going down, and you start to get loose. That pitch misses down and away. All route one for two with a walk and a single. That's Gordon Joe will start. Excuse me, Joe. Perhaps Joe Torre thinking about the emotional stability of Mariano Rivera and would like to see Sturge get through the eighth and then put Gordon in the save role and not use Rivera unless the game goes extra inning. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. I said that, but now it's Gordon getting loose with an eye on Miller, Damon, and Bellhorn in the eighth. One ball, one strike. Holrud takes it wide. Let's go down to Kenny Albert. Well, Joe Tandon starts celebrating his 34th birthday today. He grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, a huge Red Sox fan. He attended 10 straight opening days at Fenway Park. His dad, Ken, finally gave in yesterday, bought his first Yankee cap. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> took <great>. this long. <laughs> Sturts was an in-season addition to this Yankee team, and he pitched his way into a serious role in the postseason for Joe Torre. That's to left for Ramirez, who zigzags his way to it. Olrud is gone, two out. And Cairo will be the hitter. Gordon was a part of this rivalry from the other side. And he was a part of an LCS against the Yankees back in 99. A year after saving 46 games for the Red Sox. And now his job is to maintain a lead and hand it over to Rivera as Cairo takes ball one. Rivera doing his usual work with that weighted ball, trying to get that shoulder and arm loose. The 1 0. Just so you know, in same situations against the Boston Red Sox this season, the Yankee bullpen has a 6.75 ERA with five blown saves. And Rivera's on that list. Miller got him at Fenway Park in July. 93 mile an hour fastball, two and one. That's why when the Yankees scored those two runs in the bottom of the sixth, you could hear some TVs being clicked off in New England. In the seventh inning, with five in the seventh, turned them back on. Here's a 2-1 pitch. That's a fair ball. Broken bat hit for Cairo. Nixon over to get it. And he holds Cairo to a two-out single. That was close. That ball was skewering toward the Yankee dugout. Good call right over the bag. Call properly fair by Jeff Nelson. It's an interesting move here by Joe Torre or non move. You've got the left handed hitting DH Kenny Lofton at the plate. You have the switch hitting option in Ruben Sierra. And the Yankees at this point have to be in more of an attack offensive mode than let's say an inning ago. So it's lefty on lefty, and Embry checks on Cairo.
Lofton a reason. The Yankees added to that 6 nothing lead in the sixth with the leadoff home run down the line against the right-hander Wakefield. Torrey stays with him and Henry stays with Millar and Cairo over to first. In the sixth, right down the line. Ryder at first, two out, and ball one outside to Lofton. And this could be Embry's last hitter with a right hand hitting Jeter on deck and Timlin getting loose in the Red Sox bullpen. Yeah, that was a slide step by Alan Embry. Miguel Cairo is not a fast base runner at first base, but he's a good base runner. And 11 steals during the season with two outs. Not a bad play if you're the Yankees to try to steal a base. And Lofton pops it up. Plenty of time for Ramirez to get there, and Embry pitches a scoreless seven. Who's coming up for the Red Sox in the eighth inning? It'll be Miller, Damon, Bellhorn. Red Sox down by three. First pitch of the eighth inning to Bill Miller is up from Tom Gordon, who had a fantastic season. Nine and four. He had four saves. 2.21 ERA. Appeared in a career high 80 games. 2 0. Oh. Miller 0 oh for 2. He hit 283 during the regular season. 4 out of 14 this postseason. Back to the top and Johnny Damon and Bellhorn to follow, then Ramirez. There's a strike 2 and 1. It was eight to nothing. Now it's eight to five. Miller diving stop Cairo, but he can't make a throw, and Miller is on to start the eighth. Fine stretch by Cairo. The ball came up. On him and in the process of trying to get the ball out of the glove, he dropped it. So Miller with an infield hit to lead off the eighth <laughs> inning. Coming up on 11 o'clock in the East, we're at Yankee Stadium, game one of this ALCS. The Yankees jumped out to the big lead. The Red Sox got five runs in the seventh inning and a blink. Hideki Matsui has had a big night. Five RBIs to tie an ALCS record. Cena was perfect for six and a third. He couldn't get through seven. His team and takes a strike. Johnny struck out three times against Messina, who struck out eight for the night. It becomes very interesting if the Red Sox can get one more runner on of their next two. Then you've got Ramirez and Ortiz coming up, representing the tying run. And you have to start thinking about, if you're the Yankees, Joe Torre extending Rivera for more than a one-inning save. Which would have been the furthest thing from your mind half an hour ago. I thought it's exactly. Good pitch from Gordon, strike two on Damon. Good foot breaking ball from Gordon. Rivera, who flew in from Panama today, is getting loose in the eighth with nobody out. Damon strikes out, one out. Four strikeouts tonight for Johnny Damon. It's a nasty breaking ball. Just drop it off the table. The defensive swing, from Damon. Straight down. They called a 12-6 or stayed on the outer half. 
three pitch. Damon would agree, and now with one on one out, Bellhorn stands in. Mark one for three. His double broke up the perfect game last inning. And he pops up here in the left field. Slicing to Matsui, two out. We talked about Rivera early, and he appeared when we hit the third inning here, and that's right about when we expected Mariano Rivera to get to Yankee Stadium. He gets a hug from Alex Rodriguez. And then in the fifth inning, he arrived out in the bullpen getting hugs from his teammates and coaches out there. And a huge ovation from this crowd at Yankee Stadium as he popped into that bullpen, and now he's loosening here in the eighth. Here is Manny Ramirez. Ball one. Manny has been quiet all night. He has not gotten the ball out of the infield. Remember, he has tremendous power the other way. And here at Yankee Stadium, a short porch in right field. Either way, in my mind, this should be Gordon's last hitter, one way or the other. You've got two out in the inning. You've got Rivera getting loose in the bullpen. And if Ramirez reaches, Ortiz would bat here in the eighth inning, representing the tying run. You know Joe Torre wants Rivera on the mound in that situation. Yep. Gordon trying to pitch around a leadoff infield hit. One of the game's best standing in his way. And a little flare into left center field. That's going to bring the tying run to the plate. Going first to third is Miller, and it's first and third for Ortiz. I think Jorge Posada encouraged to go out in front of home plate, slow things down to give Rivera a chance as the tying run potentially comes up in the person of David Ortiz, and he has killed the game. So Rivera getting loose, no sign of Joe Torre, and David Ortiz representing the tying run will bat here in the eighth inning. Well, this is a gutsy move by Joe Torre. Ortiz takes the ball. Because the question would be asked, why is he getting loose here in the eighth if That's not right. to pitch in this spot? That's right. Ortiz has one hit off Gordon in the home run. He is the tying run at the plate here in the eighth. The 1 0. 2 and 0. So Ortiz will be sitting on something. Pilar waits on deck. Ortiz with great power the other way as he proved on Friday. And he clinched it for Boston. A 2 0 pitch. Big swing to the loss. Here it is off Washburn. And there's that swing the other way, Al, that you talked about earlier. It looks so on this. Runner at third is Miller. Runner at first, Manny Ramirez. But the man on the spot, Ortiz for the Red Sox, Gordon for the Yankees. You know, with the short porch and right, it's the it's the correct pitch to come in on him. But I think in many instances for a pitcher, you realize that it doesn't take much to hit it out. And Gordon being a closer all those years, really are careful about it, not wanting to miss in or half. Now it's three and one. You're coming inside. You don't want it right there. Ortiz hits it in the air to left center field. Back at the track, at the wall, it's off the wall. Two runs are going to score. Ortiz stopped running, but he's still going to make it to third, and it's a one-run game. 
with Rivera standing and watching in the bullpen. Ortiz goes deep to left center off Gordon. And Ortiz came within a matter of feet of making this comeback complete and getting it out of here for an 8-8 score. Joe Torre, over the last nine years, has made a ton of proper moves for the New York Yankees, but this is not one of them. Clearly. I say feed. I mean, what is it? How much of this miss? A, the glove of Matsui, and B, getting out of the park. The Red Sox at one point trail eight to nothing. It's now 8-7 with the tying run 90 feet away. Rivera, one of the best in postseason history, coming in. Millar coming up for Boston. All any team wants. They trail early by 8-0 is a chance before the end of the night. This gives the Red Sox a chance. Off the glove of Matsui for a two-run triple, and Millar could tie it with a hit. Tying run 90 feet away. It's 8-7. We're in the eighth of game one. A 1-0. 2-0. There would probably be a pinch runner for David Ortiz if there were none or one out. But with two out, you go on the theory that, for the most part, it's going to take a base hit to score him anyway. Since the start of 2002, Rivera has won five saves against Boston. Along missed it by 22 and one. And if you go back to 2001, he's blown seven in 22 chances, 14 in 170 to the rest of Major League Baseball. Trying to save it here. Tying run at third. Two out. Eight seven in the eighth. Milan pops it up. Cheater. And the Yankees are hanging on by a thread. Eight seven into the bottom of the eighth here in the Bronx. Here is Mike Timlin. The sixth pitcher of the night for Boston, trying to keep it a one-run game. And he'll work to Jeter, Rodriguez, and Sheffield, the top of the order for the Yankees. The Red Sox, looking ahead in the ninth inning, will have Nixon, Veracek, Cabrera. If anybody gets on, Bill Miller. Miller, who has already won a game this season against Rivera, at Fenway Park. So much for a laugher from either of these teams in this series. People will say, well, should it surprise you with these two teams and what happened last year tonight with the way this game started, the way Messina was pitching? Clearly, this is a shock. And the Boston Red Sox, to their credit, and this is to no one's surprise, didn't quit. They kept on coming. And here they are, one run down in the eighth. As Jeter grounds to short, Cabrera backed up and gets his man, one out. Well, this crowd and this feel here at Yankee Stadium is a feeling of unease by these fans who were just rolling, having fun, who's your daddy chance and all that. And now it's a one-run game with this middle part of the Red Sox lineup coming up in the ninth. And certainly room for thinking from the the Yankees either the players or the fans or, or a combination of the two that if you can't win with a with a pitcher out there retiring the first 19 in a row and you've got an eight run lead and they made it close under those circumstances what in the world are they going to do in a close game. With one out nobody on here's Rodriguez. Strike one. Again, looking ahead, you have Pedro Martinez and John Lieber in game two. And then Bronson Arroyo against Kevin Brown game three. The Red Sox are 4-0. and 
in games at Arroyo started this year against the Yankees. He will one. This was the matchup, even with Schilling involved. Who knew how his ankle would respond and how he would pitch? As we said earlier, with the pitching, the starting pitching the way it is right now for the Yankees, they had to bank, especially getting eight runs and getting a win tonight. Rodriguez gets a whiff one. The minute you mentioned Bronson Arroyo, a ball goes up and in to Alex Rodriguez. That's what happened. On July 24th, that started that brawl. On purpose or not, that gets the attention of Alex Rodriguez. Up and in, down and away, two and two. No two, purpose pitch, exactly. That was the purpose of it, to go up and in. Trying to drill that outside corner. The next pitch, and Tim would miss. It's two and two. Rodriguez hits a line drive, base hit to left. The ball is just jumping off his bat now. Oh, do hitters love this when they're knocked down and then hit a rope? Refer it back through the box, Al. But they'll take a line to the left. <laughs> and oh, the pitchers are so upset the fact they didn't make their pitch there. Wasn't much sink, didn't run inside. It was inner half. That's what great hitters do. Here's another great hitter, Gary Sheffield. Sheffield's had a nice night. A pair of doubles, a walk, three runs scored. But that happens when you hit in front of that suit. Strike one. Historically, Timlin has, oh, I don't want to say owned Sheffield, but he's two for 11 lifetime with uh, no damage as far as home runs. Sheffield looking to pop one here to make it a little easier in the night. I know. Normally, Terry Francona would have Mike Myers up and ready to face a guy like Matt Suey. I mean, he, either Damon or Matt Suey would be. The reason that Mike Myers is on the ball club and there's nobody up for the red Sox. So if Sheffield first and thirds him, then Timlin's got a pitch to the hottest hitter in this game tonight. Well, right now, Frank Cota is showing that he's not really a matchup guy in the sense of batting averages against and left and right. He's going with his guy. One on, one out, one ball, one strike. That's foul. Well, you might say, well, if Mike Myers gets Matsui out, who's he? You know, he, he can only pitch to one lefty or something. Gary Lowe is in the bullpen. And Terry told us before the game that Lowe would be his second starter if the game went extra innings. He'd be the guy. They have Myers left down there. Javier Vasquez is at least getting some throwing in. Which at this point is all you can imagine him doing, just stretching out. The one two is too far inside. Two and two. The Red Sox have Arroyo listed in their bullpen tonight with Lowe and Folk. A very close fastball from Templin. Looked like a strike to me. Sheffield on two and two. Runner Rodriguez goes and Sheffield fouls. Just a reminder, as you look at this jump by Alex Rodriguez, coming up next, your late local news, except on the West Coast. So Mariano Rivera. He flew all day to get here. Had to pitch in the eighth. Now has to sit in the dugout and watch the 2-2. There's another hit for Sheffield. 
And it's two on with one out, and Matt Suey's coming up again. Matt Suey has been retired once, and that was on a fly ball to left. In the first inning, went down to get it, an RBI double. He scored on a hit by Bernie Williams. Then with his sacks jammed, a three-run double off the right field wall. And in the sixth inning, one of those tack-on runs, which right now is the difference in this game. That made it eight to nothing by virtue of that RBI single down the right field line with two out by Matsui to score Sheffield. The Yankees still have a lead. Two on, one out, Matsui. Ball one down and in. I'll throw in with you, Tim. If there's ever a spot to bring Myers in to get the hottest hitter in the Yankee lineup, this would be it. You've got to try and keep this a one-run game. I mean, Terry, Terry uh, telling us before the game that Mike Myers has gotten a ton of big outs for the Red Sox. If this isn't a big out, what is? Keith Folk, the closer for the Red Sox, is getting loose now, but with Matsui at the plate, he could do the big damage. Two on, one out, eight seven New York in the eighth. Two and oh. Back to back hits by Rodriguez and Sheffield. Two balls, no strikes on Matsui. Could own a new ALCS record for RBIs in a game. Two and one. The Timlin strength being a sinker ball pitcher. He's always one pitch away from getting out of it with a double play. Matsui led the American League in double play balls last year. He's learned to cope with that two-seamer a little better this year. That's why his average has improved. He didn't see a lot in Japan. Mm -hmm. Two balls and a strike. Matsui trying to do it again for the Yankees. <laughs> On the outside corner, good pitch, two and two. That was right there. Matsui is jammed and he pops it up. Cabrera out to get it. Two out. Timlin gets the big out, gets Matsui, and Bernie Williams will walk in as a hitter. That's a terrific job by Timlin after falling behind two and nothing. He got the foul ball, the good pitch on the outside, and then he bites a fastball right in on the fist of Matsui. So Folk, who was getting ready in a hurry, the count went to two and zero oh on Matsui. And he's up a little bit out of the bullpen as Bernie Williams stands in with two on, two out. Ball one. The numbers for Bernie Williams in his career against Timlin. Rodriguez and Sheffield. This is a big at bat to keep the momentum in the Boston Red Sox favor. Getting out of the city first and second. Clearly a boost to the Red Sox hitters coming up in the top of the ninth, albeit against Rivera. Those hitters will be Nixon, Veritek, and Cabrera. Miller do up fourth. 
very well over the head of Manny Ramirez and Terry Francona telling us before the game before the night's over we may have a trail of cutoff men defensively but we'll just have to deal with it one two and now Kevin Millar comes over and Bernie Williams who should have been out at third base gets to third without a play two huge runs scoring for the Yankees to make it 10-7 Keith Fulk comes out of the bullpen for Boston. Runner at third, two out. It's a 10-7 Yankee lead. Now part of the order producing two large runs for the Yankees here in game one. Posada has driven home a run, been hit by a pitch, hit for some tonight. Back to that play, Manny Ramirez. Well, outfielders are taught to turn around, figure out where the ball is, how far over your head, and run. And then turn to see where the ball is. And Manny was watching and running while, while he was trying to get the ball. And that's not how you do it. There's a pitch that misses the ball 3-3-0. Three, three and oh. I would imagine Posada will be swinging here. He gets a fastball on the inside part. It's a changeup. Rio changeup, Posada. So Folk was thinking like you were. Green one. Another run 90 feet away for the Yankees as Posada hits a soft liner to Miller. It's a 10-7 Yankee lead. And 10-7 instead of 8-7 because of this off the bat of Bernie Williams. And over the glove of Manny Ramirez. Yankees lead by three. Ninth inning. Game one. The Yankees trying to hold on and win game number one of this ALCS. An 88-2 record in the regular season when leading after the eighth inning. Two losses to the Red Sox. Nixon leaves it off against Rivera. Goes after the first pitch and pops it up. Jeter hauls in out number one. Rivera entered in the eighth inning. With a tying run at third, two out. Got Millar to pop up the short. And now gets Nixon with one pitch here in the ninth. Here's Veritek. Jack hit a two out, two run homer off Sturts in the seventh. It's made it a three run game. Then the two out, two run triple by Ortiz in the eighth. Made it a one run game until Bernie Williams came up with a huge two out, two run double. That's how they ruled it. That's Veritek. Had a good rip, but he's in the hole one and two. We talked about Mariano Rivera in the division series. I don't think baseball has ever seen a pitcher like this. 
a guy who could throw one pitch, one speed, both sides of the plate, late action, and be as successful as he's been. It, it defies the imagination and the odds. You talk to major league hitters, they can't center the ball, they know what's coming. They can hit it on the back part of the bat. Still one and two. They pop it up, they wave through it. He breaks more bats than any pitcher in the major leagues. He's remarkable. He has the lowest ERA in postseason history. 0.71 coming into tonight. Veritek hits it back toward us. You know, Timmy, you're exactly right. And for as long as he's done it, you see out of his hand, he throws a cut fastball. You hear a lot about it. If you can see the rotation on it, it's very tight. It looks like a fastball. If you see it around a little bit, kind of like a football. If you see how it cuts a little, it's not a slider. doesn't have a slider dot, but cuts. And it's hard to vary as to where the ball is going to end up. That's why they can't center it. The one, two. It's out of this time. <laughs> two and two. That one took off. I throw a cutter, not as nearly as hard as him, but much slower, but off center of the ball and throw it like a fastball. In many instances, hitters will, pitchers will try to. That ball was down. That's why Veritek centered it. Take another look at this pitch to Veritek. Trying to come in. Middle, middle, this middle, middle down, yeah. That cutter probably didn't cut as much. But as a result of the pitch looking like a fastball and cutting late, Rivera is able to bury the speed and the, and the break. So by, by increasing velocity, we'll cut the break, and he has the ability to either keep it at the belt or have it drop a little bit like a true slider. But the way it comes out of his hand, it looks like a fastball. That's why they're not able to center it. He's done it for so many years. And the fact that he's throwing 94, 95 miles an hour, that's a tough pitch to hit. Not many people throw that pitch. Rivera now with Cabrera, and he grounds one through the left side, and the tying run will come up for the Red Sox. And it's the guy who got him in July back at Fenway Park, Bill Miller. Saturday, July 24th, that brawl game that started late, Bill Miller took Rivera out into right center. A three-run ninth inning and a victory for the Red Sox. In this case... Miller represents the tying run. The Red Sox will not go away. Ball one. And that double by Bernie Williams. Add on runs. Runners on at first and second, one out. Strike is called on the inside corner. One ball, one strike on Miller. That was a big break for Rivera. That's a questionable call. You can see Posada setting up inside. Miller thought it was inside. Very, very close. A 1-1. Two balls and a strike. Miller seems to be getting a pretty good look at these pitches from Rivera. Once again, 75 years ago today, the largest deficit overcome in postseason oh, history. Philadelphia A's game four of the World Series, eight runs, 1929. So one point, eight to nothing, Yankees here. It's now 10-7, two on, one out, ninth inning. And Miller rips it foul. Pitch was up, and Miller jumped on it.
The 31st postseason save for Mariano Rivera, the end of his long day, which started in Panama. Flying nearly five hours to get here, arrived in the third inning. Who knew? Back in the sixth inning, when the Yankees had made it eight to nothing, that they would call on Rivera for a four-out save tonight. Ending it all by chewing up the bat of Bill Miller, and along with everything else, Rivera, an excellent fielder, a strike to Jeter who completes a double play to end it. What a day for that man. Off the bat of Miller, into the glove of Rivera, to Jeter and Olrude and the Yankees. Win game one, 10 7. Let's go down to Kenny Albert. All right, Joe, I'm joined by Bernie Williams, who drove in three runs, including the Yankees. Last two runs tonight. Bernie, you've been a part of three no hitters. Mike Messina retired the first 19. At what point did you start to think no hitter? Uh, probably about, you know, I always think maybe the bottom of the third, you know, when he, uh, or the top of the third in this case, when uh, he, you know, gives, you know, a clean inning, you know, you start thinking about this guy might be, you know, going for something special here. So you start tightening up a little bit on the defense and, and that, you know, makes you more aware. Bernie, what was going through your mind when the Red Sox pulled to within 8-7? Well, I mean, it, it was a little bit surprising, but uh, that team, they might be joking around all the time, but that team is no joke, you know. They, they can come back with the best of them, and uh, they have been playing like that the whole year. All right, Bernie, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Joe, back to you. All right, Kenny, thank you very much. In the end, the Red Sox leave only two on base all night, and they lose 10-7. But they did not quit. They kept fighting, and we look ahead to tomorrow night. John Lieber, Pedro Martinez. For more information on tonight's game and for the latest information on Major League Baseball, go to foxsports.com. We look back on tonight. Mike Messina, Kurt Schilling. Messina had a perfect game going into the seventh inning with one out that ended and the Yankees nearly lost the lead But in the end they turn to their old friend Mariano Rivera He goes an inning and a third and gets his 31st career postseason save until tomorrow night Game two eight o'clock Eastern Pedro Martinez John Lieber for Tim McCarver Al Leiter Kenny Albert. I'm Joe Buck so long from New York Yankees win it 10-7